Matthew 23, verse 39, says, uh, Jesus is talking here to the Pharisees and to the people in Jerusalem, religious leaders in Jerusalem, and he says here, For you shall not see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And um, if you look at Matthew 23, throughout the, the scripture, the whole time he's saying, woe to you, hypocrite Pharisees, woe to you, you know, you're so hypocrite, you're liars, you're not doing what you're saying you're going to do. And, um, and throughout the scriptures, this is what, this, throughout uh, Matthew 23, he's warning them. And then it's kind of weird, like he's warning them and saying, you're doing all these things wrong, and this is not right. But then he turns to them, and he says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather you, uh, your children together, as a hen gathers her chick under, the, under her wings, but you were not willing. And then he says, For I say to you, you shall, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So it's kind of weird. Like he's saying all these things, and then he turns to them and he says, But you shall not see me until you call upon my name. And then in Luke 13, verse 35, it's kind of the same story, the same verses, but there's just a slight little different here. Uh, Luke 13, 35, he says, you shall not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the first time I saw this, that he says here, the time comes. There is a time, a specific time when you will call upon my name and when you will call me to return as king. Um, and so that's a, an amazing, amazing promise and the question, you know, that came to me is, again, who is he talking to? And as we look at these scriptures, he's talking to these religious leaders, these Pharisees and all these um, religious leaders. He's in the temple and he's speaking to them about these things. And it's really specific because he says here, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets, I'm talking to you. Jerusalem, the ones who stones, those who are sent to you. You are the ones, and, and this is kind of a, I don't know, kind of a covenant kind of thing. He's saying, you will not see me until you call me. So this is kind of very interesting, and this is uh, one reason why we believe that we should pray for the Jewish people, for them to call upon Jesus, to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and us uh, as Jewish people that believe in Jesus in Jerusalem, in our church, we, we say this many times. We say, you know, blessed is you who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, we welcome you, Jesus. We love you. We call upon your name. Um, but it's really interesting because he's talking here about religious people. He's talking to the religious Pharisees, to the religious leaders of the time. And so we want to see those people come to the Lord. And you might say, this is impossible. Like, how can this happen? You know, these religious people that hate Jesus, that put him on the cross to start off, they killed the prophets. They stoned those he, he sent to. You know, they carry this antichrist spirit in them. How, how would they be the ones saying, welcome is he who comes in the name of the Lord? But you know what? We have one great example in the New Testament, Paul. Paul was not this nice little Christian boy. No, he was the one who was stoning the prophets. He was the one that stood there when they were, when they were stoning Stephanus, and he was guarding his clothes or whatever. I don't know what he was doing, but he was not doing anything for it. And he was going to, on the way to Damascus, right? He was going to, to get these uh, Jewish people that believe in Jesus and put them in prison because how come you can be Jewish and, and believe in Jesus? Like this is, this is heresy. You know, you are believing in an idol. This is the way he, he thought, you know? And so we see him, we see Paul or Shaul, the way we call him in Hebrew. And through this one religious 
zealous man that loved God so much that he would, he, he um, put himself in charge. You know what? I'm going to go and take care of these Jewish people that believe in Jesus. I'm going to put an end to it because you guys are not doing anything. I'm going to do it. Okay. No one put him in charge. He just took himself. He put, he just took the role on himself. And God used this one man to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. You know, this is, this is mind-blowing. You know, this religious man who probably beforehand never even spoke to a Gentile or even sat, you know, he wasn't even allowed to sit or eat with a Gentile. Now God has sent him to all the nations and has revealed his heart to him. And he said, you are per- persecuting me. You know, you're not persecuting the Jewish people that believe in me, but you're persecuting me, Jesus himself. And so... What God did with one zealous religious man, Jewish religious man, he brought the gospel to the nations, and he partly, this is part of his seed, this is why we are able to be in this place today and worship Jesus freely, because of one man that said yes. And what, what God could do with a hundred people, what can he do with a thousand religious people that get it, you know, or a million people that get it, because they, if you see them, they are day and night, they're in the books. They are studying, they're zealous, they want more of God. They, they, they carry this, you know, wait, oh, we, we haven't done enough, we haven't done enough good deeds. Oh, I have to do, do one more deed today before the day is over, you know. So it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. But, but what, the way we see them, and many times the way I see them is like, these, you know, religious people that, you know, they might stone me and they might spit on me. And it's true because they do it, right? So it is kind of scary. But, you know, it says that perfect love casts out all fear. And God really showed me that regarding the Arab people. I remember just saying, you know, how can I, how can I love the Arab people? I, I hear Arabic and it just, you know, I just have fear. I'm in the bus you know, and I don't know, one of them could just bomb the bus, you know, I just hear Arabic and it's just, it's scary, right? And, and I just realized that, you know what, I cannot love them as long as I have fear in my heart. And that is one thing that I need to get rid of. I need to get rid of fear because when we are confident in God's love and his protection over us, we're fearless, he can send us anywhere. This is why we live in Israel, because we are crazy nuts, and because we know that God is greater, and that, you know, we are in his cen- the center of his will, and we want to be his messenger- messengers of his love. And, and it is a, you know, love is a big thing. You need to be able to, to be hurt when you love and you, you need to be able to be let down. And many of us that are in, you know, marriages and relationships, we know that. And um, so anyway, so I was just thinking about this, you know, what God could do with a few more religious, radical Jews that come to the knowledge of Jesus. In 2 Corinthians three fourteen and 16, this is what Paul says here. But their minds were blinded, for until this day... Uh, the same veil remains unlifted in the, uh, in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their hearts. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And so we know that the answer is that they need to know Jesus. They need to know Christ, because once they know Christ, you know, the veil is taking off. They're they're studying the Torah day and night, but they're missing it. They're missing it, because the the whole scriptures, the prophets, the prophecies, they all talk about this Messiah, about Jesus, who came, who died, who was risen. He's coming back, right? But they cannot see it. And so it's, it's just really easy to just blame them. And, you know, but you know what? They're, they're blinded. And God just needs to remove the blinders off of them as he removed it from Paul. 
And so this is uh, another reason that we, we really want to pray for the Jewish people because I believe that when the religious Jewish people get it, when they understand, when they know, when they know Christ... They will call upon his name. They will be the first ones to call upon the name. They are waiting for the Messiah. They are praying for it. You know, so they, they, don't, they don't see him. They need some kind of hope. So they decide that this rabbi is the Messiah and that rabbi is the Messiah. But they're not. You know, some of them have been dead for years. And they're not going to raise up from the dead. So, um, so that's kind of one thing that we really see. Because Jesus is saying, for you shall not see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Romans 11, 7 to 12, also Paul talks about a blindness that is on, on them. And I just want to read a few things. He, he says uh, 7 through uh, 12, the verses 7 to, through 12 in chapter 11, he talks about this blindness. Their, their eyes have been darkened so that they do not see. I say then, have they stumbled that they shall not, should fall? Certainly not, okay? Paul says here, they have stumbled. It is right. They're far from the truth. Okay, maybe some of them are really near but still really far away. But he says, did they fall? Did they stumble that they shall not um, get up again? And he says, certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them uh, to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches to the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? And verse 15, he says, For if their being cast away is the uh, reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And um, so we just see these promises, and as, you know, as much as we live right next to this religious neighborhood that are really radical, and it's extremely hard to go and do prayer walks through there because it's just so dark and, and heavy and, and, and fearful, to be honest, you know, but there is something. God wants them, and he's, fa- he's going to be faithful to them, and all it takes is him to remove the blinders, just as he removed the, blind, the, the blinders of the Gentiles, and then now he wants to remove it off of the Jews. And uh, I just want to talk about, like, the strategy of Satan, just to know another way of how to pray into this. Satan knows that if the Jewish people live in Israel and live in Jerusalem and come to the knowledge of Jesus and call upon his name, he will come back. He knows that, I mean. And, um, and so there's a few, a few ways to stop this plan from happening. Uh, one of the ways, let's kill all the Jews. You know, we've seen it all through history. We've seen it with the Crusaders. We've seen it with the Nazis not, not so long ago. Uh, even though some deny it, it happened. And, uh, and today we see it mainly through radicalism. They're saying, we want to, you know, take you off the map. Goodbye, Israel. Let's throw you to the sea. They say it, right? And so this is one way that Satan is like, okay, let's just kill all the Jews. That way they won't, they won't call upon his name. And uh, the second thing is maybe not have them even in the land of Israel um, once the Jewish people started even speaking about returning to the land of Israel, that's when Hitler started killing all the Jews. They started these Zionist movements. Let's go back to Israel. Let's go back to Jerusalem. So let's kill them all. <laughs> so that's another thing. We need to have Jewish people in Israel. And the third thing is um, hate and offense towards Jesus. Um, Satan wants to assure that Israel is so offended at Jesus that they will not receive him as king. And when we talk to Jewish people about Jesus, the first thing is like, that's Christianity, that's Nazis, that's the Crusaders, that is not from God, <laughs> you know? And so that's one, one thing that's kind of hard to really share about Jesus And uh, because the first association is uh, Jesus is one of them. 
And so the, I just wanted to share some of these points with you. I hope this is helpful for you guys. And just in, in kind of knowing um, how to pray into this. And, and for us also just to be able to pray into this. So we wanted to just take a few minutes and, and uh, do something a little practical. If we can just, um, I don't know, split into groups of three or four people and uh, pray for, first of all, for, our, for ourselves, for our hearts, you know, that God will remove all fear from our hearts and that we would be able to love the way that he loves. And also, you know, if it's... Uh, um, what is his plan for Israel, seeking him. And we just want to take a minute to really just pray for Israel as the church to pray for Israel to be saved. 